Please welcome Dr. Barbara Z. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jay, for that introduction. You're making me rethink my title here. It seems old and stayed now. Um, anyways, I'm really pleased to be here today. Indeed, I'm honored to be here today. And what I want to do is just spend a few minutes telling you about some of the uh, research that my students and I are doing on phytotechnologies. <clears throat> so by definition, phytotechnologies is any time that you use plants to uh, study or to solve any engineering or science problems. So I'm sure you can see there are many, many different applications. I really just want to touch on these three today. And in particular, the first one, which is phytoremediation, which is to remediate or to clean up environmental contaminants. And when we do that using plants, we're also restoring ecosystems, we're creating habitat, and we're sequestering carbon. Now, Jay said something about this being fun. This is going to be fun because plants are really fun. They're incredible organisms. There are so many different mechanisms by which plants can restore, extract, degrade, stabilize, and contain contaminants. And the best part is that they can do this synergistically. And that means that we can use plants to address all kinds of different contaminants, including metals, industrial chemicals, pesticides, fuels, etc. <coughs> And every time we use plants to clean up contaminated sites, we're avoiding or at least reducing the need for more energy intensive dig and treat technologies, we're creating new green spaces, and we're sequestering carbon dioxide. So I'm not going to bore you by going through all of these different um, mechanisms today. And I promise this is the one time I'm going to use the laser printer. I'm going to talk about rhizodegradation, which occurs right here in the root zone of plants. This is um, an area of research my team has been really active in in the last little while. So rhizoremediation or rhizodegradation, we kind of use them synonymously. This is the process where it's the microorganisms <coughs> excuse me, that degrade soil contaminants in the area surrounding the root zone. And when you think about it, this is actually the most desirable mechanism because it's occurring in the root zone, so the contaminants aren't even getting into the plants, and we're actually degrading or destroying the contaminants. So we're dealing with the whole problem at once. So again, my figure's uh, a little bit complex here, but the key is that whether you're talking about grasses or trees, like in my uh, little cartoon here, all plants release compounds from their roots. These are things like enzymes, low molecular weight uh, organic acids, and these compounds attract microorganisms in the soil. And it's the microbes or the bacteria that come in and feed on some of these organic contaminants, breaking them down into smaller and less toxic forms. And so really, it's just the presence of plant roots that is speeding up this process of rhizoremediation or rhizodegradation. And one group of contaminants that is particularly well degraded in the root zones of plants are the petroleum hydrocarbons. And petroleum hydrocarbons include hundreds of different compounds, so all your constituents of gasoline, diesel, oils, lubes, tars, etc. Some of these um, components, some of these compounds are very simple, like the one I'm showing on top, that's a straight chain hydrocarbon, that's butane, and it's fairly easy for microbes to get in there and break that compound down into less toxic forms. On the bottom, I'm showing um, uh, one of these uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So these, these cyclic ones are much more complex. They're much more difficult for microbes to get in um, to break them down. They're much more toxic, and many of them are also carcinogenic. But as you'll see, plants can assist with this. So at this point, we actually have identified, and when I say we, I mean the research community, has identified a number of different plant species that are actually capable of degrading, degrading PHCs or petroleum hydrocarbons. And these include the many species of grasses, as well as legumes, even some wildflowers, and some trees. And things like hybrid poplars and willows are especially um, popular just because they grow very quickly. So what we want to do here is we want to degrade petroleum hydrocarbons 
um, to clean up the area. But we also want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we do that already by using the plants themselves, but we can take it a step far further by involving biochar. Biochar is uh, something that, that's sort of come onto the research scene a lot in the last few years. It's simply the carbon-rich byproduct of pyrolysis. So you can make biochar, which is essentially kind of charcoal, by pyrolyzing um, just about any type of organic waste under low or no oxygen conditions. And when you do that, you produce energy. And biochar also acts to sequester carbon dioxide. It acts as a carbon sink because its residence time in soil is up to a thousand times longer than that of regular organic matter. When you add this stuff to soil, you also improve the soil quality. You're improving the water holding capacity, the nutrient cycling, etc., and that translates into bigger plants, larger plant yields, again, reducing greenhouse gases. And the fifth application of contaminant absorption is another one my group's been working on a lot. You can actually, if you build the, or manufacture the right kind of biochar, some contaminants will absorb very tightly to it, making it less available for uptake by plants or by soil invertebrates. And so now you're reducing risks to both the ecosystem and to human health. So over the past several years, my group, um, my students, technicians, some of my co-PIs, we've done a lot of different um, studies using different types of biochar that we very carefully manufactured and characterized, different plant species, and working with different contaminants. We do this work both in my greenhouse using pot studies, and we've also done a lot of field studies to sort of um, test, test this work. So I'm not going to show you a lot of data, but this is a, a nice um, picture, I think, that shows you just how good biochar can uh, work in the soil to increase plant yield effect. So you can see with 2.8% biochar addition, you can grow a substantially bigger plant. So the goal here is to combine this riser remediation of petroleum hydrocarbons, which we already kind of know how to do, with the addition of biochar, which we very carefully characterized and manufactured to have all the characteristics we want, to create a phytotechnology that's going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions both during and subsequent to soil remediation. So we're going to do that by making the biochar itself, by replacing some of these more energy intensive technologies, and by revegetating these petroleum hydrocarbon contaminated sites. And I think you can probably see there are going to be some applications for this uh, right here in Alberta, also where I live back in Ontario, indeed nationally and, and even globally, we're going to find applications for this technology. So this particular project I want to tell you about that's, that's funded by the Alberta Innovates Group um, involves some uh, petroleum hydrocarbon contaminated soil from right here in Alberta. And we start off with um, sort of greenhouse trials. And whenever we start these kinds of new projects, we start very simply with germination studies um, in the lab or in the greenhouse. And what we're, what we're seeking to do here is to find plant species that are native to the area and hopefully to the site itself. And this is just some cleaned up data here to show you that um, yellow clover and alfalfa were determined to be appropriate species for remediation in this case because they both uh, germinated very well in the soil. So here uh, in this little data graph you can just see that the alfalfa and clover both grew extremely well in the um, contaminated soil and biochar significantly increased the plant growth most of the time. And I promise not to show a lot of data graphs. I'm just going to show a couple to illustrate uh, and highlight the results here. What you're looking at is the blue bar is the amount of contaminants, so the amount of petroleum hydrocarbon at time zero, and the red bar is after 51 days. And what you see here is that when we've planted these, um, uh, these soils with clover, we've added the biochar, we get significant remediation of um, these F2 and F3 fractions, these are the fairly easy to degrade hydrocarbon fractions, the kinds of things that we'd find in a, in a diesel spill. What's much more exciting though is that when we use the alfalfa, we also get significant remediation 
of these heavier um, F4 fractions. So these are the heavy fractions of petroleum hydrocarbons that include things like lube oils and some of the um, PAHs as well. And this doesn't happen in just 51 days. In fact, it takes uh, 136 days to get significant remediation. But that's still really good because that's, that's about one long growing season here in Canada. And the best part of all is that we are able to remediate these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Again, these are the ones that are really complex, they're really hard to degrade. There's a, a whole suite of them. I'm just showing six here. All these six are on the US EPA list of um, possible human carcinogens and have been targeted for complete elimination. And you can see that across the board, we get about an 86% reduction in these after 136 days. But this only occurs when we use the biochar. We need the biochar um, to make this work. And then, what I, <laughs> this is great. However, when you go to a contaminated site, when I go to a contaminated site, and I've been to lots of them because I, I work with the military and we've got a lot of contaminated sites. For the most part, you don't get a site that's just contaminated with one particular pollutant. So it turns out that a lot of the petroleum hydrocarbon contaminated sites are actually co-contaminated with salts. And this just has to do with the way the product is brought to the surface. Well, it's really difficult for plants to grow in uh, salt-contaminated soils. They don't like that. But remember, I said plants have all these different mechanisms by which they can deal with contaminants. And so in some related work my group has been doing, we've been working with these very salt-tolerant plants. And um, the one you're looking at there is Spartina pectinata, and that's growing in my laboratory at the Royal Military College. Spartina pectinata is a prairie cordgrass. It's native to Canada, and it has this incredible mechanism whereby it takes up salt and it excretes them on its leaf surfaces and on the stem as well. And it sort of just forms that cotton candy type effect. It's very, if you just do this with it, it'll blow away. So it blows away and disperses um, by the wind. And so now what we've succeeded in doing is growing these plants and some other excretor plants in petroleum hydrocarbon contaminated soil that also has salt contamination. And again, it's the biochar that has been specifically manufactured and characterized that allows the plants to grow. So now we're getting simultaneous remediation of petroleum hydrocarbon and salt contaminated soil. So I'll just summarize by saying, obviously, I love plants. Um, I think phytotechnologies um, should play a role probably in all, um, at least in most site remediation strategies. They, um, they reduce costs, they reduce greenhouse gas emissions, they increase green spaces, and they give us this option of returning to native or naturalized species. With the addition of biochar, which is in itself a carbon negative technology, we can improve many aspects of phytoremediation. And with that, I'll just acknowledge in particular uh, my co-PI on this project, Dr. Allison Rudder at Queen's University, a couple of the um, biochar producers I've been working with, and uh, all of my funding agencies, as well as you see there some of the uh, current and former members of my laboratory at the Royal Military College. Thank you. Uh, as we've already said, you'll have a chance to ask uh, Barbara questions after the next two speakers, but because I'm already up here, I get to ask my own questions. And I just, I know you're at the, exp the experimental stage right now with this, but could you give us just a brief picture of how, let's say I presented you with a six acre site that is contaminated, how would you, how would you go about remediating that using biochar and plants? Yeah, we're at the experimental stage. We're actually ready to take this into the field. So this, um, and we've taken a lot of other, uh, a lot of the other phytotechnologies, phytoremediation in the field. We've used plants to clean up PCBs, to clean up DDT. Um, we have active sites. So um, to take this into the field where we're, and it's been done before with hydrocarbons, but to take it into the field where we have co-contamination of petroleum hydrocarbons and salt, yeah, we would, we're, we're ready to go out there. We basically, it's, it's like farming. We, we till up the land and we, we work the land. My students have farmed in some of the craziest places, the most ugly industrial brownfield sites <laughs> in, 
It looks just like a little uh, farming project. That's, that's how we do it. We go out there with whatever um, equipment is available. We plant the seeds, we set up irrigation if necessary, and we monitor the air and the water and the soil. Great. It's really neat. Thank you. Thank you.